Right now, it's my pleasure to give an introduction, and I'm going to make it quite short for our keynote speaker, Reverend Edward Pinckney. Um, I first met him last spring at a demonstration in Benton Harbor, whose high point, high moment, was when I think somewhere close to a thousand people turned their backs on the governor of Michigan as he came marching across the bridge from St. Joseph uh, and then marched on down the, down the street to his, his destination for the, for the day. That was symbolic and valuable, but unfortunately, I don't think we can uh, turn our backs very often on the governor. We're gathered today to try to, to, try to understand and, and repeal uh, a piece of legislation that, that he, he put into, he put into, uh, uh, into place, uh, sponsored and, and put through the legislature, the Emergency Manager Act. Reverend Pinckney lives in Benton Harbor, one of the first, uh, one of the first of the cities to, to have an emergency manager appointed. I'm not going to talk much about the act or, or some of the things that that manager has done. I think Reverend Pinckney will, will tell us well about that. Um, the, the thing that stands out most in my mind about, uh, about Reverend Pinckney's history is, is that, that um, here is a man before us today who has gone to jail for quoting scripture to a judge. Now, I think there are many instances of something like this in the history of the church and in the history of politics, but uh, the, the one that came, comes most immediately to my mind is that uh, perhaps we have a kind of Jeremiah in our midst, because Jeremiah also found himself in, uh, in, in the, the, the ruler's jail for for, um, uh, for for prophesying prophesying to him and demanding justice, um, the Reverend Pinckney lives in Benton Harbor. He actually, I believe, moved there from Chicago, and he is at present. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, he's president of the NAACP there, and he's also. Uh, President of the Black Autonomy Network Community Organization, and he may have things to 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 say about that. So it's called Banco, uh, but it's not a bank, not by any means. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Reverend Edward Pinckney. Let's give him a nice warm welcome. I want to thank everybody for for coming today. Believe me, it's, it's, it's my, my honor just to be here. I, it's my pleasure also. Um, you know, I, I just want to ask you uh, maybe a couple of questions. Maybe you can answer these questions and maybe you can. The first thing is politicians are the only people in the world who create problems and then campaign against them. Have you ever thought about that? They create the problem, then they campaign against them. Have you ever wondered if the Democrats and the Republicans are both against deficits, why do we have so, many, so much deficit? Have you ever wondered if all the politicians are against inflation and high taxes, why do we have high taxes? You and I do not propose a budget plan, the president does. I, I tell you, um, I'm, I'm that type of guy that understands exactly what's really going on. And I know what the, the Bible teaches me. The Bible teaches me to first take care of my family, then my community. That's which the Holy Ghost have made, have given me, have made me the overseer of. The ideology is simple. The reality is if you don't take care of yourself first and your family and your community, when you get into trouble, your family may not be able to take care of you. 
I have never seen a more graphic illustration of this text than I learned while riding one of the airplanes. It is the custom of the flight attendants to get up and make an announcement as the plane began to ascend. She says, should it for some reason start to lose pressure or start to depressurize or start to go down, you are to reach up and pull the mask from the ceiling and put it on your face first. She doesn't prioritize you as being more important than your wife or your children. But what she is saying is that they may not be able to help you if you got in trouble or if the plane went down. So in other words, what I'm simply is saying, do not put the mask on the wrong face. And what we have done here in the state of Michigan, we have put the mask on the wrong face. We have allowed Governor Snyder to take control of our communities and destroy it. That's what they have done to the city of Benton Harbor. I'm going to start off by telling you a little history of how all this came about. I'm going to be short and brief to that point. I had a plan back in 2003 to stop the hostile takeover of the city of Benton Harbor. My plan was to recall one of the corrupt commissioners because they needed six votes in order to get any land. He was bought and paid by Whirlpool. And what his job was to pay the other commissioners to make sure that they voted in Whirlpool favor. Whirlpool knew that they had these votes. But this was the first time in the history of the city of Benton Harbor that someone would challenge this group. They were the largest family in the city of Benton Harbor. Matter of fact, they usually win by landslide. But what we did, Banco, the Black Autonomy Network Community Organization, we decided that we was going to do a recall of this young man by the name of Glenn Yarborough. And they felt that we didn't have a chance in the world. People figured that there's no way you're going to beat this man because he got the largest family, they had all the money, they had everything you could think of. But we decided that we was going to defeat him. We had it in our minds that we were going to do it and we set out a plan and we worked our plan. We was going to do it with the absentee ballot. A lot of times we don't go to the polls. So what we did, we went out and got over 300 absentee ballots. Those are the people who were senior citizens, who was handicapped, the people who couldn't go to the polls or the ones who was going to be out of town. About the time they realized what was going on, we was over 300 votes ahead of them. The election happened on February 22nd, 2005. They got scared. Whirlpool went out and they started buying hot dogs for the people in the community. Started feeding them, telling them that this is what you need to do. We need to run Pinckney out of town. By the end of the day on February 22nd, we had won the election. And the Harbor Shores project had been stopped because they didn't have the votes. Now, they got mad. They decided that they was going to find someone to reverse this election. They went out and paid a young man $10 to say that I paid him $5. And that started the ball rolling. Now, you know that the election had to be important for them to go in 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, kicking in people's doors, only because they voted absentee. 
and they, the first thing that came out of their mouth was, you may have committed a crime, and we need to talk with you. So what they did, they went out and scared the folks half to death and made them say things that they knew that wasn't true. They was paying them, they was doing everything they could to come out and deal with me. They didn't have any votes that they found that was tainted, not one. But the chief of police mother signed her, 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 her husband and her sister ballots. But they didn't vote for us, they voted for them. <laughs> so they said the reason why they're reversing the election, this has never been done in history. Benton Harbor is the very first city this has ever happened. Judge Maloney, he's now, he got promoted to the federal court for this. And also he's chief judge at the federal court now. He said that the reason they're reversing this election is because Reverend Pinckney was involved. That's the reason. You can look it up. The only reason that they're reversing this election today is because Reverend Pinckney was involved. And he got a promotion behind him. They reversed the election. They put Glenn Yarbrell back in his commissioner's seat. They voted for the land. And now we have Harvard Shores. They got the six votes. During that process, they put me on trial. They accused me of paying someone $5 to vote. And they claimed that I was in possession of an absentee ballot. They knew it wasn't true, but they knew that down there in Benton Harbor, they could do anything they wanted. If, if the election would have not been reversed, there would be no emergency manager today. Benton Harbor received an emergency manager only because Whirlpool wanted that land. They wanted this multi-million dollar project to go through. They wanted to continue to take in the land from the residents. They thought that they could get rid of me by doing this. But it wasn't really possible because there's never been a fight that I didn't like. I'm always excited when it comes to Benton Harbor because I know how the people react to certain things. Well, what makes it so interesting is that I had two trials over some absentee ballots. They spent all this money in an attempt to convict me. Never in the history of mankind if there would have been a hung jury, they would have tried somebody a second time for absentee ballots in a voter's day. You never, ever, ever hear people actually going to jail for voter fraud. It happens in all the elections. If they claim it's voter fraud, it's voter fraud. But nothing ever materialized from that. But they wanted to eliminate Reverend Pinckney. They said that Reverend Pinkman is either the smartest man in the world for beating Whirlpool and Glenn Yarborough, or he's a crook. It got to be one or the other. There's no in between. But me, knowing me, I had another plan. And what they wanted to do, they wanted to stop me again. We had another plan where we're going to recall another one of the commissioners. But what they did, I wrote an article. And I put it in the People's Tribune. I may have passed it around to y'all. I wrote this article. This article simply said, if the judge did not hearken unto the voice of Lord thy God and do all these things that is right, these things will come upon him. And he said that was a threat on his life, his children's life, and everybody else's life. So he said that Reverend Pinckney had threatened my whole family. He could have probably said I threatened the whole nation too if he wanted to. But he said that Reverend Pinckney had threatened my life and my family life and he got to go to jail. We went before, we had, I had all kind of lawyers who was, who was very helpful. I had the lawyers, Gill, I had Buck Davis, Elliot. Everything went, was great, I had plenty of help. But the problem was they had to figure a way to get rid of me. 
for quoting the Bible, they gave me three to ten years in prison. Three to ten years. But what makes it so incredible, when I went to prison, the media followed me everywhere I went. And the thing about it, nobody wanted me in their prison. Everywhere I went, they kept pressuring me all over. Nobody wanted Pinkney nowhere around. As soon as I, I show up, as soon as I show up, the guards will come out and greet me, just me, and say, I don't want no problems out of you. And I said, I never created any. It's your doing. But they was excited. But here, here's where I want to go with that, because when I got there, I had only been there maybe three, four days. And the Muslim brothers approached me and told me that they had a problem, a real problem here inside the prison, and they needed my help. Now here I am, I stand a nick over five seven, and this guy about six six, and he wanted my help. I couldn't figure that out, because I figured he could still stand on his own two feet. So he said, Reverend Pinckney, we need you to do something. I said, what do you want me to do? I said, what do you, what do I need to do? He said, well, we got all kind of problems here with the food and everything else. They only give us a half a roll of toilet tissue for, for a whole week we, in all kind of issues. So I said, well, we got to come up with a plan. So here's what I did. I decided that I was going to do something. Just, I had just got there. Didn't know what, but I knew I had to do something because I didn't want this guy 6'6 six, six, breathing on my neck. So he, so we started off, I started off, I had to get all the groups together. The first thing I already had, the Muslim Brothers, which was the largest group. Then I went to the Aryan Nation. Now this guy, he had never ever talked to a black guy. In all the years he was, he'd been in prison, he had never ever talked to a black guy. And then one day I just walked up to him and asked him, could I talk to him? I said, I said, could I talk to you for a second? And he looked at me like, what is wrong with you? Don't you know my history? Don't you know I don't talk to you guys? And I said, I said, well, look, we, you know, we got a problem here and I want you to come aboard. And after I, I talked to him for a second, I told him just like this. It's not important whether you like me or not. That's not important to me right now. We got a problem and we got to work it out. So what we did, we walked around the yard. We walked and everybody could see me walking with him. You see, everybody seeing this black guy walking with this black white guy and he's an Aryan nation and he don't talk to black, he don't talk to black guy. So you can imagine, we talking about 1400 people, everybody looking at what we doing. So I'm walking around the thing, we must have put in maybe four, five miles, walking around trying to convince him that we need him to come, to come aboard in order to make this thing complete. Because remember, there was, they was the second largest group inside the prison system, and we need them. So after we talked for a little while, he decided that, uh, that he, he'll take it back to his group and see what they say. And then I, I left him with the note that it's not important that you like me. That's not important. I said, we got a problem, we need to work together. Just like this EM, it's not important whether we like each other. We have to work together to have that removed. That's why it's so important that we work together. So anyway, I'm, I'm sitting around waiting for him to come back. He came back the very next day. And he said this. He said, you know, I don't talk to you people. He said it just like that. He said, but you know, it's something about you. He said, it's something weird, he said. He said, you just walked up to me and, and you know, he said, nobody talk, everybody know that I don't talk to you people. And I said, yeah, that, I told him that's not important. So he said, I'm with you. When he said he was with me, that, that means that we got more than half now, the people that are inside the prison working with us. So I'm, I'm happy now. Now, this is when we go to the skinheads. They are the next largest group. Now, when, they, when I'm going to the skinheads, now everybody have watched me walk with the Muslim brother. 
Now they watch me with, with, the, with, the, with the Aryan Nation. Now I'm with the skinhead. And now everybody looking at me like, hmm, who is this masked man? And I said to myself, this is just the beginning because I, I, I felt like I was on to something. But anyway, let me get to the point because I don't want to take up too much of your time because I got to get to that EM pretty soon. But here's the deal. This is why this is so important. The, the, the skinheads, the Aryan Nation, and the Muslim Brothers, the Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans, the Indians, everybody decided to join on this thing. And here's what we was going to do. We was going to boycott the food. We was going to hit this fish called the buck naked fish. And nobody likes this fish. They only cook 100 pieces of this fish. 100 pieces for 1,400 people. So you know how bad it is. Nobody would eat it. So they decided, so we decided that what we we're going to do, we're going to have everybody to go in and ask for the buck naked fish. We want everybody to ask for the buck naked fish. Because we, only, we know for a fact that you only cook 100 pieces. So what we did, we sent everybody in to ask for the buck naked fish. And what make it so good, they knew something was going on because everybody was talking about it on the, on the camera. These guys have never been this happy before in their life. They have never, you know what I mean? When you came in, they, they, they treated me like I was a king. They, they, they just loved painting it. What we going to do? What we going to do? And I, my thing was that, let's hit the buck naked fish. We're going to destroy them and cop them from ever cooking that meal again. So here's what we did. Everybody went in and asked. They ran, asked for the buck naked fish. They ran out of the buck naked fish after one unit. So now they're scrambling, trying to figure out what they need to do. This is how unity comes together. This is how you bring people together so they can understand if there's an issue that you can take a stand for it. That's why this is so important. So now everybody wants some buck naked fish. And they don't cook but 100 pieces. Now, now they're mad because somebody had to put this together that they felt was smarter than they was. So now we, we're rushing in, and here we go. I'm the very last person to come in. And regardless what it is, when you're in prison, they got to give you three square meals. Even if it's peanut butter and jelly, a macaroni or, or, or some old spaghetti, you got to get whatever, you got to have three square meals. So on this specific day, I'm the last one to go in. We got about 800 folks lined up. A thousand people out of the 1,400 people actually participated in this. The 800 people, when I walked in, the warden was called in, the lieutenant general was called in, all these people was called in. They was called in because they was expecting a riot or uprising that day. This had never happened before. So now what they're trying to figure out, who's behind it? So I walk, I'm the very last person to walk in. When I walk in, everybody's saying, there he is, there he is, that's him. And, and, but the point was, I had just got there. So it couldn't have been me. I couldn't have got them folks together in that short a period of time. So what, when I got up there, I got my food, everybody looking at me, all the guards, they surround the whole lunch area because they're expecting something big to happen. So I sit down, and what I do is simply drink my water. When I drink my water, everybody gets up and dump their food. It was so dramatic, it scared them half to death. They were so nervous that they didn't know what to do. But Pinkney had another plan. That Monday, they wanted to call all the leaders in. They didn't call me in because I just got there. So they called all the leaders in and wanted to know what they want. I told them, you better not say you wanted anything because you do. You're gonna, they're going to they're gonna punish you even more. So they decided they weren't going to ask for nothing. But here's what we did. On the very next time, they had the buck naked fish. The very next time. They're going to outsmart us. So they're going to cook 800 pieces of the buck naked fish. And they're, they're preparing because they said that we're smarter than you. You're in prison, so you don't know nothing. You know, we're going to teach you not to mess with us. Because when you come in and ask for the buck naked fish, we're going to have a buck naked fish for you. So that's how they looked at it. So when they came in, 
Everybody, they was prepared for the big day. They had, you, could, the whole, you could smell the fish a mile away. It was, it was just that strong. They knew from then that something was going on. But what we did, we delayed them. We tricked them. We didn't show up. We didn't show up. Nobody showed up but the regulars to eat the buck naked fish. They were so mad that they didn't know what to do. But I'm telling you this to show you how we can all get together on one common issue. This is why Public Act 4 is so important, not just to me, but to everybody. This is why we have to sit here and talk about Public Act 4. There's no reason in this world that we all can work together and get Public Act resolved. We can do it. We can have it eliminated. All we have to do is take the time out. Keep coming, yeah, that's right. Well, the final note on that is that they're no longer serving the buck naked fish. <laughs> but it brings me to when I, when I got out and we started talking about the hostile takeover of the community. They wanted to um, build, they started building this golf course. Um, and they knew that we didn't have the resources to actually stop them. They knew exactly what they was going to do and how they were going to do it. For the first time in history, we actually, the residents of Benton Harbor, controlled the commissioners. We put four people in at one time. That had never happened before. That's after I got out of jail. Remember this, they released me on an appeal bond. So then they eventually overturned it. So that was a good thing. So now I'm back on the front fighting. Never before have we ever put, actually we put five of our people in with the mayor uh, and we was in control of the commission. Once we got in control of the commission, they decided now that they had a problem because they knew that Pinckney was somewhere involved with this. They knew that if we had four people, four or five people to win, that it had to be illustrated by what Banco was doing. So what they was doing, they was planning then, that was in 2008, of how they was gonna bring in and take over the city. They knew that the PGA was coming to Benton Harbor, but they didn't know how, especially with the new golf course, the Jack Nicholas signature golf course. They knew that they had everything they wanted. Never before in the history of mankind has something like this happened. On the Public Act 72, Jennifer Granholm is the person who brought that in. She's the one who sent uh, Joseph Harris to Benton Harbor on the Public Act 72. Public Act 72 was converted. It started like with House Bill 42, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 and 4246. Then it became Senate Bill 153, 154, 155, 156, 157, and 158. And then when it went to Governor Snyder's desk, it became Public Act 4 when he signed it. And what Public Act 4 did it gave the emergency manager, he was no longer called an emergency financial manager, he became the emergency manager on the Public Act 4. It gave him absolute power. Matter of fact, it gave him so much power that he felt that he can break the Constitution. He can do whatever he wants. In the city of Benton Harbor, his first order was to move the mayor's desk from his office and put it in the basement. Yeah, that's the first thing he did. Matter of fact, he ordered the people that was working for the mayor to take out, take the mayor's desk and take it to the basement. And they did it. Then he ordered the commissioners to turn in their cell phones. Turn in your cell phones. Well, that was, that was quite, a, quite a shock. 
Now, they decided that we was going to fight them. You know, we need the cell phone in order to communicate with the, with the public, with the people. But no, he said, turn them in. Or he was going to go and talk to the governor about having you removed as a commissioner. He also has that power. He can have you, even though you're elected by the people, he can have you removed as a commissioner. This guy was so bold and so strong, he said, he said if he voted for something and everybody in the city of Benton Harbor voted against him, he win. He said everybody. He said it doesn't make a difference. He said, not only is I'm the police chief, I'm the fire chief. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm the, uh, uh, the accounting department. I'm the payroll department. He said, uh, I'm, I'm public works. I'm everything. He said, there's nothing I am not. He said that anything that goes on in this city goes through me. He said, commissioners, I'm going to let y'all have a meeting. Then I'm going to let you take minutes. Then I'm going to let you adjourn. You can't vote on nothing. Don't even think about voting on anything. He said, I don't even want to, want to hear that you have voted. Matter of fact, what they did, they voted on something, and he got angry. He stands only about 5'5", five, five, but he got angry. And he told them, I need y'all keys to the office now. They wouldn't give him the keys to the office, so he changed the locks. They can't even go to City Hall. They can't. They don't have an office there. They don't have anything there. Nothing. Because this guy, Joseph Harris, the EM, have came in and told them what they can do, and he's arrogant as he can get. If you ever saw a dictator before, he's one. You should come and take a picture of him. That way you can put him on your dress and say, here's a dictator right here. He know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. Antagonizing the people. I mean, he'll tell you in a minute, the water bill in, in the city of Benton Harbor have tripled. 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 Every single job that the city employees worked on has been outsourced. Nothing. They only got about maybe 14, 15 police officers in the whole city. And then they have to be firemen. They're firemen and police officers. They, they merged them together. You wouldn't believe who they got working. They got, we had the snow just recently. They had to outsource that because they got rid of everybody. Nothing is left. Nothing is left. This guy has went beyond the call of duty. Even today, the pro tem, they can't even elect the pro tem. The pro tem had to be elected by the emergency manager a non-elected official. He had to put this girl in office and say, you the pro tem. You can't vote on them. You can't vote on nothing in this city. Anything in this city that need a vote comes through me. I make that decision. And if all y'all voted against me, and I voted yes, it's yes. He was going around telling everybody that the books is balanced. He was telling everybody that the books had been balanced. But Governor Snyder, they was using Benton Harbor as a model. He was telling everybody the reason why you should have an EM is because look at Benton Harbor. Just recently, they found out that we're in worse shape now than when he came. We're in worse shape right now than when he first came to Benton Harbor. And look, he's a professional accountant. The people that was there, they didn't have his credentials. He's doing the same thing they were doing. 
He's doing the same identical thing. We're in worse shape right now than we ever been. But they got their golf course. They got their golf course. They got the PGA coming here. They got all the things that they need. We used to have over 20,000 people living in Benton Harbor. Now we got less than 10,000 people. They're driving all the people away. They know what they're doing. But we're allowing them to do it. We're just as bad as they are. We have to say enough is enough. Now, what he just did recently is almost unheard of. He put our radio station on eBay. <laughs> he put the radio station on eBay, including the LCC license, which is illegal. You got to get permission. You, you, got, you can't sell FCC license without getting permission from the FCC. But he's, he got this dictatorship in his mind that he's in control of everything. That he didn't, he, he's, I ain't, forget about FCC. They ain't going to do nothing. But they sent him a letter. They sent him a letter. And he took the radio station off. Now what he's trying to do, he's trying to figure out a way how to get around this. But this is just the beginning. This is what those, those EM does. He's, he's not for the people. He's for these corporations that come in and suck the life out of the people. That's what he do. He comes in and he tries to sell everything that's sellable. Selling lots, the Cornerstone Alliance, which is a subdivision of Whirlpool for $1, which is worth over $10,000. He's been selling lots. Every time they, we got the N, N, NPS2 money, NP, NSP2 money, the national, the, the, the N, yeah, NSP2 money, which is $14 million. Cornerstone Alliance got $7 million of that to knock down houses, which belongs to the residents of Benton Harbor, because the EM allowed him to do it. We're in such a predicament that we, we the people have to take a stand. We have to show them what we're made of. Anytime that you can put a radio station up on eBay and then tell, tell the people, we'll let you know. We'll let you know. We'll let you know what we're going to do and how much we get for it. And we'll allow them to get away with it. The EM, he's got to go. There's no question about it. What he have done to our community, what he have done to our community is criminal. But it's not criminal until we tell him it's criminal. They've been doing the same thing for years, over and over and over again. And we have failed to stand up as a group. Here's what we have to do as a group. We know that Public Act 4 is out here. We know that we, we need 160,000 good signatures. We need that. And we know that we can do it if we work together. The only reason the buck naked fish story was told today to show you what we can do if we work together. And don't worry, there's a lot of times people may not like you. I'm probably one of the most hated men in, in Benton Harbor. But I work with everybody. I will do anything to help folks get this thing done. And we have to take this thing to another level. We don't depend on what somebody else do. It's what we do. That's what's important. Until we learn that, we're still going to be just twiddling our fingers. We have to change the way we do business. Anytime there's an issue that comes up, it affects you. And you may not have an EM now, but it's coming to your door next. That's right. It's coming whether you like it or not. So look, what happened in Benton Harbor, they figured Benton Harbor was a group of individuals who didn't know nothing, had no resources to fight, couldn't stand up for anything, don't know nothing. They just there, uh, poor, you know, uh, even, but they got rich land, surrounded by water. They knew that. But they said, what we're going to do, we're going to test this EM out in Benton Harbor. Let's see what, what happens down there, then we'll take it all over the state. But I tell you, we put up a fight that they would never forget. And I love it for it. And I tell them right now, you know, there's never, ever been a fight that I didn't like. 
And I, we have to take this thing to a whole different level. We know where we need to go, but we got to go as a group. We cannot go as individuals. Too many times we try to do things as individuals and it don't work. It don't work. So we have to work together. We have to show them what we're made of, things that we can do. We have something in common here, whether you like it or not, we got the EM Public Act 4. And then you got to remember this about Public Act 4 now. This is important. You heard the story of the Trojan horse. You know, the, 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 the Greeks, they, they made a, a Trojan horse. And, and what they did, see, the, the Trojans inside the, the gates, they thought that this was a gift. Huh, this is a wonderful thing. Got us a nice Trojan horse, and all the Greeks, was, they was going, they, they got in their ships, but they was hiding in the bushes. They were waiting for them to push the Trojan horse inside the gate. So here's what they did. They were so happy. They were so happy to see the horse and also see the Greeks leaving that they thought they had a major victory. So what they did, they went out and pushed this Trojan horse, which is Public Act 4, pushed this tro Trojan horse inside the gate. Then what they did, they went back and locked the gate, you see? So the, the Greeks couldn't get in if they wanted to. So when they locked the gate, you know, they, they was feeling good, but inside the Trojan horse, they were full of EMs. They were full of them. They were full of EMs. You know, but they didn't know that they was full of EM. So they inside the city party. They getting down. Everybody happy. They drunk and everything else. They drinking nothing but alcohol and doing whatever they do. And they having a good time. You know, the Trojan horse there, they just rubbing the Trojan horse. Oh, they did us. We, they were scared of us. They couldn't get in. And, and, and now we, we got this horse, that gift they're giving us. So they scared of us. Yeah, they pushed it in there. And later on that night, the EM jumped out took over the city, took over the city, killed all the men and women, took all their possessions, sold their radio station, <laughs> put it on eBay, did all that. And look, and they didn't understand, the Trojan horse is not a gift, it's full of EMs. Public Act 4 is full of these EMs. They have trained over 400 of them right now here in the state of, of Michigan to come into all these cities and take over. Easter just got them another uh, EM. So it's time that we move this thing to a whole different level. There's something that we can do. And always remember, look at Public Act 4 as a Trojan horse. It might look good, but it'll kick you. They're the king because it's destroying the people that live in the city of Benton Harbor. It's chopping us up left and right. This is why we have to move. We have to take this thing to a whole different level. Until we're able to do that, we'll never get anywhere. We have to do it. And on that note, I just want to say one more thing, and I'm going to leave y'all. I want you, yeah, I got to leave y'all. <laughs> I got to leave them up here, let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, remember, Public Act 4 is basically a Trojan horse that's filled with EMs. And it's time that we say enough is enough. Can we say that? Let's say everybody say, enough is enough. 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 And on that note, I'm going to have to say goodbye. <laughs>